And welcome to the Daily Space Weather Show. We've got some massive solar prominences both in the east and at the southern polar region, also in the southwest. Also a CME on the way, a coronal mass ejection, likely to cause a significant geomagnetic storm, possibly even a major one, and some disparities about the speed of that incoming plasma. Here's a close-up for the past 24 hours of the southern polar region, just to show you that great crown prominence. Now, that's a feature that we see a lot more around solar maximum than we do any other time throughout the solar cycle. So does it mean we're currently at solar maximum? Well, absolutely not. We're still expecting solar maximum in October of this year. But I figured I'd, you know, show you that nice close up there. And here are the past 24 hours in 171 extrems, the house favorite wavelength. And we'll get back to some more fresh imagery of the sun here in a moment. First, please take a moment to press the like button. And if you're new to the channel, press subscribe. Tell your friends and foes about us and do so by pressing that share button. Thanks to everybody who has. You'll also find links below the video to our own websites, our merch shop, Amazon store, and more. So check out all of that stuff. Once again, thanks to each and every one who views the videos. Congratulations on realizing the channel exists. Let's talk about a fundamental quote, a quote about the fundamental basis of science itself. By Feynman, I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers which can't be questioned. That's right, there's no such thing as belief in the realm of science because you never know when there could be a new paradigm shift, right? If things suddenly change, well, you don't want to be ossified in your beliefs, right? So question those answers, especially when the observations do not match up with the hypothesis. You know, if all of the data that you see does not support your hypothesis, your hypothesis is wrong and ought to be abandoned. Let's get back to space weather. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux is 174 solar flux units. 174. There it is over the past year depicted by that there black line. So we've seen a little decrease in the sunspot number as well as in the radio flux in the past 24 hours. And Space Weather Enthusiast Dashboard is actually forecasting some geomagnetic unrest tonight. Why? I have no idea. It doesn't mention as to why on there. And if you look at NOAA's Enlil spiral, it's not really showing anything there either. So I don't know what's up with that. Also, if you look at ESA's Enlil spiral, it's going to show a CME impact here at Earth late in the day on the 3rd. So we've been seeing some some pretty miscalculated uh, speeds as far as coronal mass ejection impacts. So maybe that's another one. I don't know. But we're expecting by tomorrow's daily space weather video to be in geomagnetic storm conditions from the CME that we forecasted arrival, you know, late sometime late in the day tomorrow, sometime after noon tomorrow universal time. So but that's the ESA's model, the European Space Agency. So take that with a grain of salt. Next, the past four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space, and things are calm out there. So you're seeing this fairly homogeneous magnetohydrodynamic pressure right now for the most part. And yeah, solar wind is very nominal right now. So nothing exciting coming in at the moment, but tomorrow we expect things to get a little bit more interesting. Hopefully some aurora will be visible at mid-latitudes in places like here in Pennsylvania. Next Earth magnetic moment from the ground. It's our ground magnetic perturbations map. You can check it out yourself at the Space Weather Prediction Center, one of the many features of NOAA's Space Weather website. So yeah, things geomagnetically calm here at the moment. And of course, we can expect to see major gyrations coming tomorrow. KP index, which is an average of global geomagnetism, currently at... 1.67. So that is a geomagnetically calm situation. And I wish I could get rid of that tooltip because I'm aware that I need to press click to exit the full screen. I, I don't know. With thanks, Windows. Thanks for the tooltip. Maybe you can't see that. I don't know. KP 1.67 is the current situation. Next, let's look at solar wind from ACE and Discover. ACE is less than two protons per cubic centimeter for solar wind density, solar wind velocity here just under 440 kilometers per second at Discover. A little denser and a little faster. 
also seeing a more consolidated signal there from Discover. So current conditions are over 450 kilometers per second for the solar wind velocity. Solar wind density here at just over 3 protons per cubic centimeter. Goes back, the tometers here are smooth. We can expect to see those jump around quite a bit within 24 hours. Again, geomagnetic storm likely on the way. And let's take a look at the heliosphere next. So Earth should be back in a North Pole-oriented magnetic sector, and indeed it is. That would have been a forecast that we made two days ago. So yeah, back in the North Pole magnetic sector there, depicted in green. And we can expect a few more days of North Pole magnetism. There's the last image. So probably in probably tomorrow we'll still have a North Pole oriented magnetic sector when we make tomorrow's space weather video. So here's our line of sight field plot. The photosphere magnetism depicted in grayscale. Polar fields are in green for north and red for south. Solar B field, which is the field that goes through the magnet, depicted by those blue potential field surface source lines. There's a last image, and things have been fairly stable over the past 24 hours. Next, moving on to coronal holes. Coronal holes are super important as they show us the solar polar field reversal process, which takes place throughout the solar sunspot cycle. And around solar maximum is when you can expect to see the most trans-equatorial coronal holes as they slowly make their way to the opposite poles throughout the cycle. So that's the past four days. Here is the last image. And we can see some south pole oriented coronal hole sectors rotating in. So next coronal holes from SDO, the 211 angstroms wavelength. And that is a south pole oriented coronal hole feature there rotating into the northeast. Uh, it does extend across the equator. So you'll see that become more and more well defined in the coming days. And let's move on to sunspots. The sunspot number has now dropped below 200. So we were over 200, well over 200, all the way up to uh, 220 sunspots there. Now back down to uh, about 198 sunspots. 198 sunspots is the current sunspot number. So the most active region was in the southwest, which would be your lower right of your screen. And we had as many as 14 likely named groups there in our solar flare probability computation device. There's the current situation. And let's look at sunspots from SDO. There we go. There's the continuum. So not a lot of degradation here. Uh, I think we had some setting sunspots for the most part. Bringing the sunspot number down a little bit, that's pretty much what happened. Uh, we do see some likely active regions rising, especially in the southeast, uh, but things pretty stable here over the past 24, the period of time depicted there at 30 frames per second. Here's a quick view of the SDO magnetogram. The other data set you can get from the helioseismic magnetic imager. likelihood of major flares isn't really that high. And moving on to energetic particles and flares. Now we do have a slightly increasing likelihood of solar energetic particle events. So we may see a spike in the proton flux, especially considering that the most active sunspot of the past 24 hours did produce an M2 class flare. And uh, yeah, as it gets closer and closer to that western limb, it becomes more and more likely to produce large flares, as well as produce solar energetic particles. Solar energetic particles are relativistic particles traveling at a significant percentage of the speed of light. They get trapped in Earth's magnetic field lines, emitting radiation as they spiral those magnetic field lines. So here's the X-ray flux over the past 24. Again, things pretty calm. Largest flare was an X. Uh, an M class, an M2 class flare. So M2, and here are flares from the SDO. 
So here we've put together 94 plus 131 angstroms, the two optimal wavelengths through which to view solar flares. And you'll see that M2.17 class flare down there in your lower right, right in there. And we've, of course, included an extreme close-up of the T-mass, which would be the most active sunspot. So, not too bad, not too bad. And before we get the coronal mass ejections, let's take a look at what's going on in the solar system. So, here's our solar system forecast. And welcome to the month of July. Here's where things are today. Here's where things will be on July 8th. We will have a crescent waxing moon by the 8th of July. We'll also have both Saturn and Neptune in retrograde. Next is our star chart as that is oh my goodness that is what's going on overhead right now we're located in lehigh valley pennsylvania as mercury and venus chase the sun toward the western horizon jupiter will set ahead of them next is our astronomy photo of the day it depicts a spiral depicting the history of the universe i won't get into the debate about belief in the Big Bang and things like cosmic microwave background and so on. A lot of it's conjecture. Some of it is backed up by lots of evidence. And But there's the, you know, 13.8 billion years ago, you had these things happening. And then 11 billion years ago, only globular clusters. And then finally spiral galaxies at 10 billion years ago. And then moving way ahead, you've got 7 billion years ago, these stars like Alpha Centauri and Lalande, and so on and so on. The moon is believed to have formed around around now oh, you could put a number for it there uh, sometime around 5 billion years ago it looks like. Something like that. Yeah. 4.8 billion years ago. Something like that. Finally the oceans would have formed and so on. And It's a pretty interesting graphic. Uh, a lot of this is backed up by the fossil record. Once you get into the more modern portion, of course, apod.nasa.gov if you want to check it out yourself, apod.nasa.gov. Now moving on to CMEs, coronal mass ejections. We did have one significant one. Actually, a couple here have popped off in the past 24. Are they earthly directed? Well, no, they're not. And we did catch that sun-diving comet there as well. Here we've moved in one step and added the 193 angstrom 60 minute. Oh, we're not, I'm not showing you that. All right, hold on. There we are. That should be better. And we're going to skip stereo A entirely today because it's got enough missing data that I'm not going to show it. It's got a lot of missing frames. So this is a 24 hour video at 30 frames per second. I don't know why the Earth scale is there. I definitely did not place it there. I put it up in the uh, in the upper right there where it would be behind the aperture, but for some reason it moved down there. This is an unrecoverable error. But, yeah, so you will see some CMEs there, including one very bubble-like coronal mass ejection coming out of the west. And getting into whether they're earthly directed, let's move in. There's the 193 angstroms, 60-minute running difference, along with 304 angstroms in the Lasco C2. And yeah, those are not earthly directed CMEs. You will see one bright flash happen there. That is a far side event. Uh, so yeah, we don't anticipate any of these being earthly directed. And we'll cut back to that, but first, solar filaments. So we have some very massive and very dense filaments once again, especially in the southern hemisphere. Uh, some of those would be worthy of names. I mean, maybe this one here. Maybe that one there. And if you want to name filaments after living people, your friends, your foes, or even yourself, join us over on X. X.com forward slash smash mash otherwise known to sane people as Twitter, where censorship continues despite what Elon Musk's pathetic fanboy sycophants have to say about it. Censorship continues, so you'll have to go look for us there. You probably won't see the tweets. Just follow the hashtag name that filament. If you want to name a filament after somebody, a living person, then 
just tell us which filament you want to name. Put the hashtag name that filament and tag at Smashomash, and you'll have named a filament. Here's a grayscale imagery. <clears throat> you can see prominences by showing the grayscale imagery. That's why we show it. And let's get the bonus features, but first the past couple of hours from the Go 16. So some major prominence is going on here. And bonus features start with satellite charging hazards. Do we have any? Well, nope. It's smooth sailing for satellites. Electron flux here coming up off the floor back at nominal levels. So those are just normal levels. And there is the forecast model from NOAA. Looks like they'll be maybe a little bit low on their forecast, and then the next one they'll be way high on their forecast because we're getting a CME tomorrow, and that'll drop the electron flux. Next, the F layer of the ionosphere. Feel free to pause the video on this frame if you're not familiar with the temperatures of the atmospheric layers, the penetration of electromagnetic radiation, and the chemical concentrations of atmospheric layers. The F layer is what we're showing here. That's at about 300 kilometers of altitude. Things are looking pretty normal to me. And if that imagery is Greek to you, don't worry. We'll show the anomaly gram. So that's the ionosonde, the raw megahertz. And here's the anomaly gram depicting anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median. I would note once again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, that the South Atlantic anomaly is now on the South American coast, right on the 45 degrees west longitude line. I mean, you can see it very clearly where it now is located. Having been way over here and near the center of the South American landmass, now it's way down here, hundreds of miles away. So that's interesting. Does it mean the apocalypse? Well, certainly not. Does it give us some reference as to perhaps some changes in the pole shift? Perhaps. Is it a polar excursion? Well, definitely not. It's not enough of a polar excursion to be even considered a polar excursion from a geological basis. So anyway, there's the ionosphere. We'll show the global ionosphere now cast as well. It depicts total electron content and anomaly on the left and maximum usable radio frequency on the right, along with its anomaly. Again, things are quite normal in the ionosphere. No reason to get in a bunker based on that. So here's our high-res imagery, the intensity gram and magnetogram. We do have a fairly magnetically complex sunspot facing Earth. It's that one right there. That is at least beta gamma class. Let's see. It's beta gamma delta, barely. So that's a possibility for flares. And then, of course, we've also got this group down here. That has been the most active sunspot. That's the T-mass. Check it out. There's like a clover leaf shape there. And that is beta gamma delta class as well. Uh, but again, those aren't super complex sunspots. And we'll close out today's daily space weather video on filaments because... They're what turn into solar storms on a regular basis. Corona mass filaments become coronal mass ejections, folks. And we've got some more big ones there rotating in. So anyway, thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network least busted name and news. And until next time, may that solar wind be at your back.